Airing on Asheville FM in Asheville, this is the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week we're featuring an interview with Matt Scott of the Atlanta Community Press Collective, updating us on the movement to stop Cop City in light of the recent indictment of 61 people on racketeering charges by the state of Georgia at the end of August, as well as the legal shenanigans of the city to block a public referendum on the police training center that would destroy the South Atlanta forest and river. Then we'll be hearing a recording from A Radio Berlin on the No Border Camp that occurred in the Netherlands in August of this year. This audio also appeared in Bad News number 70. And finally, you'll hear a segment by anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. My name is Matt Scott. Pronouns are he or they. And I am a journalist uh, with the, the Atlanta Community Press Collective in Atlanta, Georgia. Cool. And thanks for coming back onto the show. We had you earlier this year speaking about the harassment of Atlanta Solidarity Fund people and updates on the case uh, of folks, cases of folks involved in the movement to stop Cop City, the building of a large police training center by the Atlanta Police Foundation in the Wilani Forest in the south of Atlanta. And there's more news breaking at the moment. In fact, um, you just dropped a story about upcoming demonstrations being called for Anyway, thanks for coming back on the show, and I'm excited to have this chat. Not excited about repression, but um, yeah. So you've had a busy week, or a few weeks. On September 5th, your project, ACPC, broke the story that eight days earlier, the Georgia Attorney General's office had indicted 61 people on state-level RICO charges, including people who had already either faced RICO or faced other charges related to the wider political and social movement to stop Cop City. I wonder if you could talk a bit about the RICO charges and what the stated criminal enterprise or conspiracy is that they're being accused of. Yeah, sure. So this uh, sweeping 61-person RICO indictment uh, came down, as you said, on September 5th. The individuals indicted you know, date back to events and arrests that happened all the way in uh, May of 2021. And the indictment itself links actions all the way back to May of 2020. Um, It it starts the alleged charges uh, with the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. The story that it attempts to tell, it begins with uh, this sort of Wikipedia-esque, almost AI-generated narrative about what anarchism is, what mutual aid is, what collectivism is, and says that all of these things sort of work together uh, to underpin the movement to stop Cop City. At the center of it, the indictment uh, sort of paints the Atlanta uh, Solidarity Fund, or three organizers with the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, as as the core group leading uh, the movement to stop Cop City. And, you know, there are, I, I believe, something like 141 acts, or I, I forget the number. There are a, new, a number of acts uh, alleged to be, you know, in quote-unquote furtherance of the conspiracy that range from reimbursements uh, for supplies like glue or food in amounts as little as $11.91 to one individual signing their name ACAB after they had been arrested uh, in relation to the forest earlier. Um, So prosecutors allege that uh, any of these acts uh, have served to connect all of these members in a vast conspiracy to commit felonious uh, acts to stop the construction of the cop city facility. So most of the the people who have been uh, indicted under this are are individuals, there are 42 individuals who have been previously uh, arrested and charged with domestic terrorism. Um, And then as well as a number of people who were arrested uh, with criminal trespass charges in the force in May of 2022 and people who were arrested at a, uh, a protest in Cobb County of Brass Food and Gory uh, that same month, as well as several people who have never been arrested in relation to the movement. Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned it's a Wikipedia-esque connection because I was just checking out the Wikipedia page, um, and they do make the Wikipedia page makes that connection, claiming that the Stop Cop City movement is a part of the... Uh, they identify it within their 
auspices or, or categorization as being a part of Black Lives Matter and the climate movement and dating it back to the uh, George Floyd uprising. Uh, do you think they just copied and pasted it from Wikipedia? I, I, I would say they probably took a lot of uh, what they have from Wikipedia. I haven't read the Wikipedia page uh, on Stop Cop City lately. I know it gets updated fairly frequently, so I'm not sure what changes have been made. But, you know, it would it would be just the same to say that the Stop Cop City movement came out of, you know, previous uh, environmental justice movements or the civil rights movements. Like, of course, any protest against the state sort of has the same origin story. Um, you know, we're all connected by just disparate or what what is seemingly disparate aspects of struggle, but are really all struggle against the same oppression. So in a part of the press conference that I heard quoted on Democracy Now! last week, the representatives of the attorney general's office, it might have actually been the attorney general, I'm not, I'm not recalling. It was. Okay. Said that that inclusion in this RICO indictment you know, to, to point to what you just said about like they could be members of the civil rights movement or members of any ecological movement in the past, made the point of saying that Georgia's RICO laws are not as stringent and strict as what one might expect from the federal RICO laws or what might one might find elsewhere and allows a lot of leverage for or opportunity for those bringing the charges to make connections such as uh, connections between people who may not even have ever met each other, but still being filed as a part of the same conspiracy with each other because they're committing acts that the state is determining are in furtherance of a criminal conspiracy. Is that a fair read? Yeah. So the origins of the racketeering and corrupt organizations acts in, in their various forms, and there's a little bit of a difference, or, well, I would say a substantive difference between the federal RICO uh, act, which is a little harder to prosecute, and the Georgia version of the act, which is easier to prosecute, and that's why these are being charged on a state level and not in federal court, uh, despite you know there being FBI participation in the joint task force assigned to stop uh, the cop city movement. Uh, so the the racketeering act was was designed so that basically the mafia uh, you could you could connect all of these disparate felonious actions to leaders at the top. Uh, and so while, you know, mafiosa bosses were, were never committing uh, these alleged acts, their alleged subordinates were, and they were used to tie the acts of the subordinates to the acts of the superiors in order to take down the leadership structure of, of the mob. Uh, more recently, we've seen it used uh, here in Atlanta against a group of teachers uh, who were convicted of tampering with standardized testing. Uh, and then last year, uh, the Young Slug Life uh, group was, was uh, RICO charges were brought against them. And then uh, even more recently, uh, the Trump election conspiracy was indicted under RICO charges uh, for 18 people, including Trump himself. And then that same grand jury that was used to indict uh, Trump was actually uh, what we're, we're told is the same grand jury who was used to indict these 61 people under these RICO charges. So it's an attempt to connect, you know, every sort of act that they can possibly think of as a part of this vast criminal conspiracy and, and tie it all together so that, you know, an action taken, you know, none of these people might have taken any of these actions, but they're still going to be charged under this act with the actions, you know, like property destruction that, that have been taken over the course of this protest movement. One question I had, and you may not know the answer to this, but was the, so if a grand jury is impaneled, does it have to be the same agency bringing the indictment before them for them to decide on? For instance, I think it was, my understanding, let me check my notes, was that um, Democratic DA Fannie Willis of Fulton County was the one who was leading the call for indictment by that grand jury against Trump and company for the election issues. Uh, however, Republican state attorney general Chris Carr was the one bringing the uh, request for indictment against the um, Stop Cup City folks. Is that uh, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. The uh, grand jury was impaneled by uh 
Fulton County DA, uh, Fonnie Willis. Uh, and, and I had that same question. I wasn't sure that, that, you know, one grand jury could be used by the same or a different prosecuting body than the one who impaneled it. Apparently it, it can. And so there's been this theory that, um, the attempt to stop Cop City is sort of a quid pro quo um, from between city and, and county level actors uh, to state level Republican actors. Uh, so in exchange for uh, Governor Brian Kemp sort of putting the uh, or squashing the Buckhead secession movement that happens here in Atlanta kind of on a yearly basis, he asked for support from city leaders uh, in in putting uh, or or in continuing the the cop city project, so it's in line with that theory. Of course, we have no actual evidence that that took place, but that is sort of the mutually agreed upon theory here: is that there's a coordination uh, and quid pro quo between between those two uh, Democratic and Republican forces. Yeah, because I was going to be a bit surprised if the Democrats in the state of Georgia were against the building and and um, yeah, enriching of police uh, <laughs> police infrastructure. It doesn't seem like the Democrats anywhere, let alone in in a former Dixiecrat state. Yeah, and you know, in particular with the Atlanta Police Foundation, uh, there was a, a bill introduced um, last year that enables individuals to donate to police foundations and take uh, up to, for a couple filing jointly, up to 10000 for an individual, up to 5000 and for businesses, uh, up to 10% of their Georgia tax uh, liability off. So you can donate $5,000 to the Atlanta Police Foundation. If you owe $5,000 to the state of Georgia from your uh, yearly taxes, that is canceled out. So that, that bill was actually uh, co-sponsored by a Democratic representative. So there, there's effectively no difference between police support from Democrats and Republicans here in the state of Georgia. As the kids say, you love to see it. So uh, for the, the three members of the Atlanta Solidarity Fund who were indicted under these RICO charges and who we had spoken of before as being in, indicted under RICO charges, are they being charged in a different county? Was that initial indictment um, just reasserted within the this wider RICO indictment? Or is this some case of, I don't know if this falls under state law or not, but like double jeopardy? Uh, it doesn't fall under double jeopardy. So because the RICO uh, Act needs some sort of predicate felony uh, in order to be enacted, uh, any any sort of felony charges that are, are held against a person can be used as as furtherance of this act. So their previous arrest for the Solidarity Fund 3 has actually been used as underlying evidence that RICO uh, needs to be charged against them. So it's not double jeopardy. It actually serves to further the argument for RICO. I'm going to probably take a second as I sift through these like <laughs> these questions. I mean, just reading through, like, to be candid, like, just reading through the articles as well written as they are, there's so much going on <laughs> just over the last week of, of uh, yeah, responses and, and reactions from uh, in different levels of court uh, that it's and and you because the movement is diverse and, you know, people are doing direct actions of various sorts, ostensibly as part of the movement. I can't say one way or another, not knowing that. But and then also there's the filing of signatures for the referendum and then the court actions related to allowing for the referendum to occur. That this is when I said that you've been busy, I mean, just like untying the notes or like the, th the threads of this mess. Yeah, it seems like a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. Uh, you know, it's, it is my full time job. So thankfully, I have time to, uh, to sort of sift through all of it. But it, there's always something it's, it's always growing. And uh, it, 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 <laughs> it continues to, to take up a lot of time just to understand. So you had mentioned the like the breakdown of of some concepts within anarchism as a part of the indictment and trying to tie this whole thing together under anarchism. I, I guess like there was a Rolling Stone article that was linked from one of the articles on the ACPC about this 
uh, where one of the like someone from the movement was just asked, like, what do you think of this? And they were like, well, that's a pretty good explanation. Chat GPD did a pretty good job, I guess. But do you think that there are wider implications to not only tying the activity of in court filings of what are being alleged to be criminal activity back to 2020, when I'm sure there's a lot of people that were involved in street movement things, and also to the theory of anarchism. Like, for me, it it seems like the farther back they cast the net and the more ability that they have under something like RICO to claim that there's some nefarious mass conspiracy, including unknown indictees, that it opens the space for them to, I mean, I think, you know, pull in people that they maybe assume were involved in protests around Rayshard Brooks's murder or the autonomous zone that was uh, created in the aftermath of his police, his murder by police. So it's not kind of a question. It's just sort of like a, (laughs) what about this? (laughs) Yeah, they can, at this point, they can connect really anything, uh, you know, they're, they're alleging that May 25th, 2020 was the date that all of this started. So they could connect anything that happened from that point uh, until now as, as, as part of this RICO conspiracy. So if you were arrested, you know, at, say, Centennial Olympic Park, which is where uh, we held most of our protests in, in 2020, you could be connected to this if you have written uh, a cab on, you know, if you've been arrested for, for writing a cab as graffiti somewhere, you could be connected to this. So there's, there's a, a very large net that is being cast. And the question is how fine of a net they're going to end up putting on this. You know, they, they still have uh, wrapped up in this RICO indictment, the, um, Southern Poverty Law Center attorney who is acting as a legal observer uh, on March 5th, uh, when police arrested uh, and charged 23 people with domestic terrorism at a music festival in, in the Wilani Forest. Uh, so it, it really does speak to what seems like a fact that they are trying to instill fear and chill any sort of dissent against the state. Uh, and it's going to be a matter of how deeply they want to entrench themselves in that position and how much tacit support they're going to continue to get from, from Democratic administrations in doing this. And, and thus far, we have heard no condemnation, uh, as far as I am aware, from Democratic actors in Atlanta, or uh, on a city level, I should say, uh, against the RICO indictments. We have seen some state-level uh, Democratic uh, elected officials you know, call out these charges, but but as far as a city level, uh, you know, political force goes, there hasn't been any condemnation. It's very interesting in the home of the civil rights movement that that this is going unchallenged by the very people who claim to hold that legacy of civil rights. Yeah, absolutely. So, in terms of like you mentioned, the SPLC and one of their in-house lawyers who was a legal observer um, catching these charges and um, legal organizations have responded to this. I I wonder if you could talk about like what the 61 people, some of whom already have some degree of like, I assume some degree of like legal defense going on because of the pre-existing where they have been charged domestic terrorism, state level domestic terrorism charges. I'm assuming that like one reason that the, Solidarity Fund was attacked is because there has been coordination for the defense of constitutionally protected activities such as protest against government action. But are there any legal organizations that have been rallying to support the defendants or the indictees? And um, yeah, any like notable ways that if, if people in the audience are either connected to the legal profession or interested in supporting, you know, pushback against the chilling of constitutionally protected protest rights that they can, could pay attention to or um, check out more? Yeah, certainly. So there is a program in Atlanta that is run by the Southern Center for Human Rights called Bridge. It, it's, it's come out of three years of, of protest defense, uh, you know, from 2020, in which Southern Center lawyers uh, pair defendants of, of protest-related charges with, with attorneys. And 
what we're seeing right now is because of the vast number of people that have been charged, we have a, an insufficient number of attorneys uh, able to represent them. So, uh, you know, there are conflicts of interest where attorneys cannot represent multiple defendants uh, sometimes under the same case. So uh, unless we have 61 attorneys willing to represent 61 different clients, we're going to have some sort of issue. And so the Southern Center has put out a call for additional attorneys. Um, you know, if there are attorneys uh, who are in the city of Atlanta who, who are interested in, in supporting that, the Southern Center uh, would be the point of contact uh, if you're an attorney from outside Atlanta and are willing to pro hoc vice into Atlanta uh, I believe you can also reach out to the Southern Center and and get connected that way. But yeah, there is definitely a paucity of legal representation uh, that these these folks are facing right now, and it is causing you know some fear and concern amongst the defendants. Uh, there's also something to be said for these defendants themselves are, are having trouble um, you know keeping jobs. The people who've been charged with domestic terrorism have been struggling financially for for months now, and then. Uh, individuals who haven't been charged with domestic terrorism but who have now been charged with RICO are in that same boat. And if you live sort of further afield and out of state, you're going to have to travel to Atlanta some point in the near future in order to turn yourself in, uh, to pay your bond, and to be able to leave. And so I, I know several defendants are, are raising money individually for that. So uh, you know, there's, there's the bridge uh, from Southern Center for Human Rights, there's the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, and then there are numerous GoFundMes happening uh, for these defendants uh, to be able to even get down here to turn themselves in. Not to cause a panic, but if people donate to so the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, can they be named as co-indictees for this sort of activity? We haven't seen that yet. Um, that is a very real concern. Uh, you know, it is it is how far are they going to take this? Uh, is donating to a bail fund something that is going to become illegal? Um, so far, we have not seen prosecutors do that. That... <laughs> that may be a bridge too far. I, I'm not sure. We've seen some fairly uh, wild things happen over the last year uh, in terms of charges for individuals. So, it, you know, I'm not going to say it is not impossible. It is. It doesn't look likely at this particular moment. That is a large number of people wh whom they would have to indict uh, if they were going to go that route. And I, I, I should add to that, that um, part of the original charges for the Solidarity Fund 3 were charity fraud. And so under those charges, they do say that individuals who donate to the Solidarity Fund do donate on the expectation that their funds are being used to bail protesters out. Uh, so, it, you know, that particular indictment or those particular charges would would seem to to indicate that, you know, donating to the Solidarity Fund alone is not cause for criminal concern by the state. Um, it is taking money out of the Solidarity Fund that they are looking at uh, in terms of criminal charges. Yeah, just make sure don't don't comment ACAB in the uh, the comment next to your donation. Um, you know, or do. It, it could be a this is Spartacus sort of moment. I, yeah. <laughs> or I am Spartacus, I guess. It's, it's been a while since. <laughs> I am Spartacus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's see. The last time we spoke, the Stop Cop City Coalition was collecting signatures for a public referendum, um, I think, to challenge the for voters in Atlanta to be able to challenge the lease of the land of the South River Forest to the Atlanta Police Foundation, which is where Cop City is trying to be built. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. And yeah, what a what a busy year this month has been. Uh, so yesterday, uh, that would be Monday, the September 11th, the Stop Cop City Vote Coalition turned in 116,000 signatures on a, a petition initiative to place uh, a question to Atlanta voters as to whether or not they would like to overturn the 2021 lease of the uh, South River Forest to the Atlanta Police Foundation for the construction of the Top City facility. So that entire process has, has gone on longer than the initial 60-day period that was originally allotted on. Uh, initially, under City of Atlanta law, the only people who were able to collect signatures for that referendum uh, petition were City of Atlanta residents. Um, there was a line that they had to attest or swear that 
I, a City of Atlanta resident, have witnessed these signatures being gathered. Um, in early July, a lawsuit was brought by five Stop Cop City uh, advocates in unincorporated DeKalb County, sort of where this facility is going to be built, who argued that it, it is a violation of their First Amendment constitutional rights for them not to be able to collect uh, signatures on, on this petition. So a preliminary injunction, I should say, was um, provided on July 27th from Federal District Court Judge Mark Cohen, uh, and he ruled that anyone can uh, collect signatures for the, for the referendum and as uh, a means of recompensing those who were deprived of their civil liberties, Judge Cohen reset the 60-day window. Uh, so the initial window was going to end on August 21st. Uh, under Judge Cohen's preliminary injunction, that window moved to September 25th. Uh, the coalition had initially planned to turn in their signatures, and at that point, uh, they had 104,000 signatures, I believe, on August 21st. Um, just before that, they had learned that the city planned to use a voter suppression technique known as signature matching, it's something that Georgia Republicans have done uh, for years and something that Georgia Democrats have fought against for years. But here we have we see city Democrats using that uh, that same method. And so the coalition announced that, you know, it would seek even more uh, signatures and would delay its turn in until September, they were going for September 22nd, uh, in order to combat what it was likely to be a larger number of invalidated signatures since the city was going to use this process. On September 1st, a three panel judge uh, in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals issued a ruling that stayed the previous preliminary injunction, which put the referendum in sort of a limbo position. It was unclear whether signatures would be able to be turned in, given that the, the 60 day window at that point was kind of effectively nullified. So what the coalition had decided to do at that point was turn in the signatures as quickly as possible. They took kind of a few days to debate how they wanted to do it, and then they turned that in uh, yesterday, September 11th. And they were met with the city. Uh, so they, they'd contacted the city and sort of worked out a process. Uh, they brought all of the signatures to the city and they were met with a form that the city said, we will accept these signatures. However, we will not validate uh, the signatures pending the outcome of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals case, which at this point, final arguments are not set to be turned in until October 3rd. So we're in a bit of a limbo position with the entire referendum process. Um, yesterday, after the city denied uh, that they would validate the signatures, the, the referendum coalition's lawyers went to a, a back to Judge Cohen and asked for him to issue uh, a ruling that the city should begin validating the signatures and that regardless of, of you know, how uh, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals decision turns out, the city should go ahead and begin that process for the sake of, of everybody's sort of constitutional liberties. There were a few things that were noted in the article that you all, or that I noted in the article, one of the articles that you had presented on the referendum and the challenges being made to it concerning like uh, Judge Scott McAfee, for instance, recusing himself uh, from the proceedings. But also there was a note made about how the city should be engaging with the referendum through individuals who are nonpartisan and not connected to the legal engagement. However, the there were representatives of the inspector general and the attorney general's offices that had been responsible for um, statements that came through the city about the referendum. Is that right? Am I mucking that up? Uh, so statements that had come from through the city about the referendum uh, have their source origin or the PDF documents that released those statements, I should clarify, have their source origin in partisan actors. Uh, the first, um, or well, there was a, the second update that was supposedly released by the uh, Office of the Municipal Clerk, which is supposed to be a nonpartisan entity. Uh, it was authored by Michael Smith, who is the uh, Mayor Andre Dickens' press secretary. And Mayor Andre Dickens has been you know, the most consistent uh, supporter of the Cop City Project in Atlanta uh, politics uh, you know, over the last uh, year and a half or two years since his election. The second or third update, I should say, was authored by Robert Ashey III, who is the attorney, the lead attorney for the city's 
court battle against the referendum in federal court. Uh, so he's been brought on to advise how you know to defeat the referendum in court and you know should not be the one authoring uh, legal strategy on how the city plans to fairly evaluate and validate referendum signatures. And so in the meantime, um, like, again, as as the signatures were being collected the last time that we spoke some months ago, the groundbreaking had already occurred, the destruction of forest, the like silt was already showing up in the river. Can you talk a little bit about what you know of the well, a why there why why wasn't there an injunction against the construction or destruction occurring? But if you know that answer, and um, secondarily, like what that what state that process is in. So environmentally, there are actually two lawsuits that are happening uh, concurrently. There is a lawsuit filed in DeKalb County Superior Court against the issuance of the land disturbance permit, alleging that. Uh, that permit violates the Georgia Environmental Protection Act. And there is now a second lawsuit in federal court that, that argues the same, uh, except in violation of the federal EPA Act. So those uh, lawsuits are a little bit more technically complex and have not been as widely reported on. Um, but there are lawsuits uh, sort of arguing the environmental impacts are, are damaging in, in both state and federal courts uh, that are pending um, any sort of, of ruling. In the meantime, it's not actually stopped the destruction of, of parts of the forest, right? The construction is ongoing, the grading of the land and such? Yes. Uh, to quote the Atlanta Police Foundation uh, in a quote that, that you know kills me internally every time that they're able to use it, construction continues apace. But so does so do other forms of protest. Being a being that this is a movement that isn't a centralized conspiracy, you see people acting um, on their own accord in their own ways, and yeah, according to their own ethics. And so uh, I was just pulling up the article. Uh, okay, so on September seventh, y'all reported and shared some video of a protest that occurred outside of the um, proposed cop city location, uh, as well as people going into the area um, and doing nonviolent civil disobedience uh, in order to disrupt the process of, of destruction of the land and construction of the site. Can you talk a little bit about what you witnessed? who's known to be participating in this and how it was received uh, within the community? Yeah. So uh, on the morning of September or 7th, a group of about 30 people gathered in a, in a site a couple miles away from the construction facility. And uh, it was largely led by members of the clergy coalition. They gathered, they sang songs, they prayed, uh, and they provided encouragement to five individuals who were wearing chains around their bodies um, who were prepared to go into the construction site and chain themselves to construction equipment. So I believe it was around 9 o'clock that group left, uh, the five left, and then there was a caravan of supporters that, that left shortly thereafter to set up a support rally. The first group was able to walk into the construction site. Uh, there's a, there are two construction entrances. The police have set themselves up off one entrance, uh, and they, they had nobody on this sort of southern entrance, so they were able to just walk in. Uh, the construction gate was left open, and they ran to the nearest uh, piece of equipment, which I believe was a bulldozer, and ch- uh, chained themselves to it. Meanwhile, the supporters set up a rally of about 25 people just outside of construction, posted calls to action for other people to come and, and join the protest. This has been well received by so many people on social media. Uh, when we posted about it, numerous people were saying, "Finally, thank God! You know, some sort of direct action is taking place." People have been supportive of these more traditional means of, of engaging in the political landscape through electoralism and, and through the referendum. But there's been this underlying desire to see some sort of direct action take place uh, for quite some time. The last sort of major direct action that we've seen was on March 5th, uh, with the destruction of, of much of the. Uh, equipment that was currently on the site. There were numerous people that were driving by, I would say somewhere in the dozens of cars and trucks and MARTA buses that drove by honked their support. 
against the facility or of the protesters, which was, uh, you know, quite heartening to see from my end. And since then, you know, we've we've seen uh, so much support of of the people who who had carried out that uh, that demonstration. So in sort of that same vein, this morning, uh, we had the announcement of a November 13th action, or they're calling for a mass action to attempt to block construction uh, of the site. This is kind of in line with previous weeks of action. There's, there's going to be several days. They're calling for people to come down on November 10th and take part of this action on November 13th. Uh, they're planning a multi-city tour. I was just told that it's uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 cities uh, have been confirmed to be part of this tour. Uh, so organizers are going to go on this tour, encourage people to come and join them in Atlanta on November 10th, and then ideally carry out some sort of action to temporarily or permanently halt construction on November 13th. And when you're saying they, can you talk a little bit about what's known about Block Cop City? What, yeah, what sort of group it is, who they represent or who they claim to represent or, or any sort of info so people can know what they're getting into? Yeah, so the Black Op City group uh, say they, they have been part of the movement for you know quite some time. Of course, with the repression related to the movement, uh, there have been no names given uh, about who they are. Uh, but they said that they've been members of the grassroots movement uh, for over the last two years. And so this, this was announced on Cop City social media. So they are in some way connected to, uh, I would say, the larger movement and the social media accounts that, uh, connected with the movement. But as far as individual groups behind the Black Cop City, you know, group, I, 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 we're not sure. Uh, there's, a, there's a space on their website for groups to join in as sponsors, but at this point it is empty. Yep. <laughs> Maybe that makes sense considering the pending legal activity. Cool. That that makes a lot of sense. Uh, just to go back to the to the public action, the nonviolent civil disobedience that occurred just recently, there was a little like ceremonial space that was opened up along the fence line. There's video on the video that I think you shared on the site that showed a number of pictures that were zip tied to the fence being cut down by police, as well as an officer with an assault rifle uh, with a very long, like large clip. But getting back, I guess, to the to that ceremonial space, can you talk about whose pictures were up there and who put them up and what it was uh, what it was celebrating or mourning? Yeah, so organizers uh, for that support rally had put up pictures of individuals killed by police violence. Um, and it sort of connects to a, a recent action that, that is taking place in the movement. Um, on Early in August, uh, a police officer named Kieran Kimbrough, an Atlanta police officer named Kieran Kimbrough, uh, killed a 62-year-old deacon named Johnny Holman. Um, Holman's family actually joined with Cop City protesters, you know, because Cop City protesters have been saying this entire time that police violence is the problem and that Cop City will only exacerbate that. So uh, the Holman family was connected to Cop City protesters. They held a demonstration together, um, and it sort of brought home that very real reality of Cop City and police violence. And so there was a sort of an altar set up and, and pictures of, of those people who have been killed by police violence. Um, you know, to connect those ideas and to remember the very real stakes of what happens if this facility gets built. Woo! <laughs> okay, um, that was the questions that I had. I have to say thank you so much for, I mean, I'm still, I, yeah, this conversation, I think, helps to clarify some of the points that were made in, in the articles on the site and not because you all are poor writers, but just because as yeah, like you're writing articles as things are happening and then you can only make an article so long while like pointing back in footnotes to prior articles uh, or or reportage from other sources but thank you very much for yeah if i if i was i every time i run up against what what can i explain what can't i explain what should i include what shouldn't i include to try to keep an article length but at an appropriate amount where people will actually want to read it there's been so much history to this movement over the last two years that if i were to write you know all of the relevant information uh we'd be in the several thousand word uh mark instead of the ideal like you know thousand to fifteen hundred words that that people tend to read yeah 
Well, yeah, again, thank you so much for doing that work um, and being present throughout this to be able to offer um, reporting on it and get the voices um, further afield from on the ground. Yeah, I guess, are there any other sources you'd like to point to for people to pay attention to this or um, any things that are on the horizon that you're aware of that might change, you know, but besides the upcoming October, um, like final arguments in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals case, if I didn't mess that up? Uh, yes. So I, I, you know, I would follow Cop City Vote Coalition social media accounts. Um, they are at Cop City Vote. Um, of course, the defend the Atlanta Forest social media accounts to find out what's happening in the, the movement at large. Um, of course, please follow the Atlanta Community Press Collective. We do our best to update everything that is happening um, with this movement and how quickly things are, are, are moving. Um, our Twitter account is Atlanta underscore press uh, and our Instagram account is ATL Press Collective. Our website is atlpresscollective.com. And do you all have a Patreon or anything like that? Or do you just take direct um, donations if folks want to support local, like on the ground reporting on movement activity? Yes, if folks would like to support our work, uh, we are a 501c3 fiscally sponsored organization. All donations to us are tax deductible. Um, you can donate to us at opencollective.com slash ACPC. Awesome. Matt, thank you so much for this conversation again and, and uh, again for all the work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks for having me. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. <laughs> The Anarchist Radio Berlin. From across the pond. So it's the Anarchist Radio Berlin. With audios in English, Spanish and German. And please, don't mention the war. You can find us at channelzeronetwork.com and aradio-berlin.org. And now some words from Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain. When I was seven years old, I was abducted by aliens. True story. I've never spoken about it, but this is what I remember. I was laying in bed at night. My bedroom was at the end of the hall, and I could see from my room all the way to the living room. I could see the side of the television. And just as I was drifting off to sleep, a feeling came over me, and I was suddenly alert and fully aware of what was about to happen, as if I had seen this movie before. My bunk bed began to shake and shimmy, and bright lights flashed in through my bedroom windows, a blinding white light. I knew that when I yelled for my dad, he wouldn't hear me, but I also knew that everything would be okay. Then the light receded, and the shaking stopped. I knew I would yell for my dad and he would be able to hear me now and would come to my room and seem perplexed about lights and shaking bunks and he would have heard nothing at all when it happened. Importantly, after this occurred, I knew I experienced missing time, perhaps an hour or more. And I knew this because of the sitcom I heard on television when the shaking started and the different sitcom on TV when it all subsided. Not until years later did I learn that all of this, particularly the missing time, is consistent with alien abductions. Others who were abducted have turned to hypnosis to recover the memories of that lost time. In some instances, all they remember is an owl staring at them, as in the movie The Fourth Kind. In other instances, abductees report being taken aboard alien ships and being subjected to medical examinations, some of them more invasive than others. I recently went under hypnosis in order to recover my lost memory, and the results were pretty interesting. It turns out a message was implanted in my mind, seemingly there for me to find and to share. So... I'll take this opportunity to recite for you what my alien captors implanted in my mind back in 1976. Here goes. Greetings, humans. We come from a distant world 
and we have been monitoring and observing life on your planet for a very long time. We are far advanced and have developed great technologies as well as a wealth of knowledge and wisdom. We are asking nicely that you please stop fucking everything up. In your history, you have thinkers who have persuaded you to disavow two of the three great superstitions. Those you refer to as Copernicus and Galileo have debunked the myths that your world is flat and that your planet resides in the center of the universe. For a long while, we held out hope that as a species, you would also disavow the third great superstition, but we have come to accept your species as a failure. That third superstition that has fatally doomed you is your universal belief in government. As a species, you hold it in high regard when subjects obey the commands of those you imagine to have the right to rule. Your perceived virtue of obedience to government, which you deeply believe and which you pass on to your children, has never led you to anything good. Your obedience has not brought you order and peace and happiness as you imagine, but has brought you greater and greater chaos, war, and suffering. What you are falsely taught to be the purpose of government, to create an orderly, peaceful society where everyone may experience happiness, has never manifested in your world by any claimed government, ever. Your species bemoans the evils committed by governments, and you catalog all the ways that even the governments of your own countries are corrupt and bad. But you continue to assert that government is a force for good, and that, as a species, you need government. You hold that government is a noble idea that sometimes goes wrong, rather than an antiquated and superstitious belief that is false and wrong and irrational, even to its very foundations. You observe the multitude of variations of life that surround you on your planet, and you recognize that no other species requires the many to obey the commands of the few. And rather than interpret this as evidence of your captivity to false myths, you believe that your singular divergence proves that you are exceptional and superior. You believe that your species is prone to make terrible choices and that you are incapable of practical self-management, requiring recourse to government. What you do not recognize is that your fallibility is not an argument for the necessity of government, but is rather an argument against it. Given the concentrated power in fewer and fewer flawed and impractical rulers would lead to a society less orderly, less peaceful, and less enjoyable. You now experience the very chaos and mayhem and madness you seek to avoid, and it appears it will only get worse. We embed this communication within this child to convey it to you in order to confirm for you that we are in fact responsible for the pyramid structures you find distributed across the face of your planet. We constructed these structures long ago as a network for complex navigation and communication with intelligent life. They will become useful in the future, perhaps as long as 70 years from now when you've gone extinct when the sea levels have risen and the whales, with their larger brains and superior communications, can access these pyramids on what will be the ocean floor. In the meantime, we ask that you stop touching shit that doesn't belong to you. You're fucking everything up. End of transmission. So, yeah, that was the alien message that was implanted in my mind. I know. It feels a little disappointing and embarrassing that they came all this way to find intelligent life, and we're not it. Whales? Who knew? 
This is Anarchist Prisoner, Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown, Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio. Find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR. P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. 